Stewart, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book-by-book, chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. Okay, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God. We've been waiting on you. We're ready to get back with this rendition of Elijah. What does the Word have to say concerning him? What does it mean to us in this generation? It means a great deal. The examples that we've discussed in the last two lectures, we will conclude uh, woven within this lecture this evening. Was Elijah to return to this earth again? Well, we'll find out, won't we? From our Father's Word, we ask His blessings, a word of wisdom in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We have covered Elijah. It is stated in Malachi that he shall return before that great day of the Lord to show us, God's children, to turn our hearts back to the Father's, plural, meaning there are two fathers, meaning there are two messiahs. Satan is the father of this world. Which father do you follow? follow? It's real easy to become deceived in these end times if you don't found yourself and ground yourself in the living Word of God. There's no great in-depth, uh, hidden mystery to those that simply with their open hearts and minds wish to know the truth, the simplicity in which Christ taught it. Yet the wise of this world stumble and fall short, even in the religious communities, of understanding the plan of our Father. It's so simple. And those that have eyes to see and ears to hear are so very fortunate. Don't let a day go by without thanking Him for that. So, with Elijah being a type, we observed how that he pulled together in the last study 850 super preachers and said, hey, go ahead and do your stuff, friends. Show Israel which God you're serving. And then Elijah alone called the fire of God down on that altar and it was burned and the people knew it was not Baal that they should follow but the almighty living God. Update this now to the New Testament. We're not going to turn there, but you might make a note for your study. Romans chapter 11. Paul was saying, has God forsaken Israel? Is it all over with them now that we have the New Testament? He says, God forbid, for I myself am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul was a Benjamite. And then he said, would you not what God said to Elijah... It's important that you know this. When Elijah said, Father, I'm all alone, they've digged down the altar and they seek to kill me, God said, don't you worry about it, Elijah. I've set aside 7,000 that will not bow a knee to Baal. That did not come to pass in the book of Kings. But it shall come to pass in the prophetic sense in this end times when God's elect refuse to bow a knee to Antichrist. The majority of the world will take part in the great apostasy thinking he is Jesus. It's sad, but it will happen. This generation shall see it. If you do not believe it now, then dear one, you believe it when you see it come to pass. So in Romans 11, we are told of that 7,000 of God's election of how the Gentile and Israel should be dealt with concerning the graftation into the tree of life, which is to say Jesus Christ. Now, many would say and deceive you by teaching that John the Baptist was Elijah. Elijah never died. It would have been impossible for the body not have, that did not die to enter into the womb of a woman. That's just impossible. It doesn't happen. However, we find quite the contrary that John the Baptist was not Elijah. It is written in the Old Testament 
that it would be Christ's second coming that the true Elijah would appear before him. John the Baptist came only in the spirit of Elijah. We will document that from the Word of God, not the traditions of man. I want you to turn with me to chapter 11 in that great book of Matthew. I want to pick it up with verse 14, for many people pull this verse out of context and says Christ even taught that John the Baptist was Elijah. He did not. Christ knew very well who John the Baptist was. Christ knew very well it was the first advent, not the second, uh, in which uh, Elijah would appear. Okay, chapter 11 in the book of Matthew, verse 14, that verse that is so often used out of context, Jesus' words concerning John. And if... Anytime you see an if, no, there's a condition, okay? You have to take that condition into um, mind, into consideration, or you're going to be deceived. If, and if ye will receive it, if you will receive John, this is Elias, which is to say Elijah. If you'll receive it, this is it, which was for to come. In other words, if you will receive me as Messiah of this world and John the Baptist as Elijah having returned before that great day of the Lord, then he is Elijah. Well, they did not receive John. The world did not receive John, nor did it uh, issue a Messiah. As a matter of fact, uh, John would soon be beheaded because of the lust of um, one Philip the lust for his own wife's, uh, his stepdaughter. So we see then that Elijah was not, it was not taught by Christ rather that Elijah came, returned to this earth. It was a, there was a condition that they must receive him. They did not. Let's find further proof. Let's turn to Luke and let's find in the announcement when Zechariah had gone to the temple to, to uh, do his course as a Levitical priest. Uh, and he was told of the approaching of the birth of this one John, a supernatural birth in as much as a divine, a birth that divine intervention brought to pass. Probably would be better ex explaining it, a better explanation rather to say. But we are told there, and so many people read over it, in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, let's Listen to God's Word and let it speak for itself. Don't try to add anything to it. Understand who this John was. You see, God named John. He didn't, uh, he didn't allow uh, Zacharias or Elizabeth to name the child. God named the child John, not Elijah. Why? Because of the aforementioned condition. Luke chapter 1, verse 17, and it reads, this uh, John being addressed, his uh, conception and birth being announced, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, which is the Greek for Elijah in the Hebrew. Did it say he will be Elijah? No, let me read it to you again and don't draw it out of context. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, of Elijah. In other words, he was only in the spirit of Elijah, that baptizer, that forerunner, the one that per would provide the way, the path, the highway for Messiah to come. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. What is this word just? the wisdom of the elect. Zadok in the Hebrew tongue, Ezekiel 44 for you scholars. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Not for Antichrist, but prepared for the Lord at His second coming. These are very important things. If you listen to the lesson, you're going to see again another way of seeing the chronological order of events 
that bring about and consummate the end of this earth age and the entrance of Yahweh, Son, Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus, the Christ. Not the fake, not the false, but the true Christ. So, we see then that as the Holy Spirit was speaking to this one, we are told that um, through the angel that appeared to this one, that John would go not as Elijah, but in the spirit of Elijah, in the power of Elijah, and how precious it is. Well, now this might still be difficult for some to realize. Well, I've heard all my life that John the Baptist was Elijah. Well, would you believe it from John's own lips, from John's own witness? Let us turn, if we may, on forward to the book of St. John. <clears throat> there is a report of John the Baptist within that book of St. John. We find it in the chapter 1 as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to pick it up with verse 19, but first let me set the stage. John the Baptist, of course, was down by the river. He was in the wilderness. He was baptizing. He was teaching repentance. He was telling of the coming of Messiah. It was causing quite a commotion. It was drawing many people out of the synagogue for they were in a tither. They were anxious. They were happy after baptism and of the teachings of repentance by this one John. So naturally, the chief priest, uh, appointed, of course, by man, not God, sent forth certain to question John. Now, will you believe the words of John? Listen closely. Chapter 1, Luke, verse 19. And this is the record of John. Do you understand that? This is God's word we're reading, and it says, This is the record of John, John the Baptist. Can you believe it? Well, I would hope so or you're hopelessly lost uh, and refuse to have eyes to see. This is the record. This is the account. This is how it was concerning John the Baptist. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? In other words, they want to know as well. Who are you? Now you're going to hear from John's own lips the account. Do not let man twist the words of God into saying, Oh, well, everybody knows John the Baptist was Elijah. No, they don't, because he wasn't. Did John claim to be? Did he say he was? Verse 20. And he confessed and denied not, but confessed. In other words, he didn't mess around. He didn't mince words. He very clearly confessed, I am not the Christ. In other words, it was being uh, spoken that he was Messiah. He sets this to rest first. Any, I think anyone can understand that. I am not the Christ. Christ in the Hebrew tongue means the anointed one. It's, I'm not him. 21. They're still in the tither, these people sent from the synagogue to find out why so many were being drawn away. So they continue and they ask him, What then? Who are you? What is this? Art thou Elias? Are you Elijah? And he said, Now listen closely, this is John speaking, and I think you can believe John. He was filled with the Spirit. He was born of a divine intervention, his birth itself being a miracle from a womb that was too old to bear, and that was barren. These words came from his mouth when he was asked personally and firsthand, are, if you're not the Christ, if you're not the anointed one, then are you Elijah? His answer is, I am not. It seems simple enough to me. But it wasn't for them, and it may not be still for some today. So they continue questioning. Art thou that prophet? Are you that prophet Elijah? Now this is real tough, so hang on. 
This would be John the Baptist answering. And he answered, comma, in O. That word is no. I, I would think most everyone could understand what that meant. So don't let some would-be uh, theologian try to tell you that John the Baptist was Elijah. He wasn't. He said, no. Of course, you know now with the research we've done in this very lecture that he was in the spirit of Elijah. He would have been Elijah by divine intervention had uh, they received him. God knew at the foundations of the earth they would not receive him. Therefore, he was not Elijah. He was John the Baptist, divine named John, and was that forerunner and was in the spirit of Elijah. You see, there are many in the spirit of Elijah. In, in a sense, the Elijah ministry of the end times. That forerunner of the second coming. 22, let us continue. Then said they unto him, Well, who art thou? Who are you then? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? Who do you think you are then? Verse 23. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as saith the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah, which is to say Isaiah. Make a note of Isaiah chapter 40. What is it, verse 2 or 3? This is where Isaiah was foretelling of Elijah. That uh, at, in, in a prophetic sense, at the end times. Was John then Elijah? Was it speaking of him? No. John was making it very clear that he was in the spirit of Elijah for this is the work of Elijah, that work described uh, in uh, verse 23. If you make a note of Isaiah chapter 40, you will find there that he is making a way and preparing a people for the Lord, preparing a people that can do God's work, preparing a people to know the way of Christ to do the work of Christ against Antichrist, to take the nonsense taught by man away from the plan of God and teach God's plan straight on, simple, in the simplicity in which John the Baptist taught. Are you Elijah? No. You know, people have trouble with that, friends. Did you hear me? There are people that have trouble with that. Pray for them if you, if you like, because I feel sorry for someone that has difficulty understanding John's words. They're very simple. I think most children, if the adults would not confuse the mind or the issue and would give them the circumstances head on, would be able to answer the question. They understand what no means. Most parents have taught them what the word no means, but the parents themselves apparently don't understand know in relationship to the traditions of man, what the masses say and teach. Never be pulled away from the true word of God. You're headed for trouble if you do. If you listen to one little side trip that is a tradition, it makes void the entire word of God. The path is narrow and the path is straight of truth. One little fact presented as a fact, I should say, by the traditions of man take you off course five degrees. That's not too bad if you catch it within the same uh, thought. But ten miles down the road are three books. Hence, in studying the Word of God, you are so far off course if you will visualize straight on and five degrees close in is not bad. But as you go further on, it veers out to a terribly wide gap. You're a long ways from the truth. So rest the case in your mind. John the Baptist was John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the flesh son, though by divine intervention, of Zacharias the priest of the course of Abai, which is that course that fixes the exact 
birth of Christ that teaches us that the conception of our Lord took place on December the 25th, not His birth. There's ever so much wisdom within that. But don't ever let any man cloud the simplicity that John the Baptist, therefore, was a flesh entity, a soul within himself. There was no room for Elijah to possess that one. The spirit of Elijah, however, was there. The spirit of Elijah shall teach on <clears throat> just before the great day of the Lord. Where is that prophecy? It's in the book of Malachi. It is so important that God caused it to come to pass that it's then it has to do with the last verse in the Old Testament. You see, John the Baptist was the last prophet. John the Baptist was the last of a long line of prophets, yes, including the, Mal the, the minor prophets, with the last minor prophet being Malachi. <clears throat> and Malachi has a very strange title. <laughs> The word Malachi, what does it mean? It means messenger. It means God's messenger. We're going to pick up in chapter 4 in a moment, but while you're turning to Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, I want to read chapter 3 to show you that we are talking about Elijah, and also it will help you chronologically fix certain events that will help you prepare for the road, that will help you prepare people, that will help you find uh, the order of events. Chapter 3 of uh, Malachi, verse 1. You're not going to have it on your generator. You follow in your Bible. Behold, I will send my messenger. Elijah is a messenger. And he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. That's Elijah of the covenant. Whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. There's no ifs, ands, or maybes. Christ did not come to his temple, and were we... Well, let's take it one more verse. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. You know what that is? That's lie in cleansing. This is not Christ's first advent. Hey, we're reading in the Old Testament, beloved, and we're talking about Christ's second advent. He did not come in judgment in his first advent. He came as the lamb slain. He came to pay through sacrifice for our sins. We're not talking about the coming of Lord here as full of soap, being a sacrificial lamb but as King of kings and Lord of lords, ruling with a rod of iron. Many people say, Oh, isn't Jesus sweet? Yes, He is. Isn't He wonderful? Yes. Words cannot describe how wonderful He is. But don't you ever picture Him as a panty waste, my dear one. He is not sweet to his enemies. Let me say that again. I assure you, he is not sweet to his enemies, nor his own that have whored around with another Messiah, another husband. That's why he said, Woe to those that are with child when I return, those that give suck, meaning those that had on the wedding garment ready for the big wedding, they were so anxious they hopped right in bed with Antichrist, found themselves spiritually impregnated, uh, mentally, with their fly away, fly away blues. How deception works, how the mark of the beast deceives people. I know I may frighten some, beloved, I do not and have, I have no intentions whatsoever of frightening anyone, only of teaching our Father's word. It will not happen as the apostates teach it. It will happen as it is written in our Father's Word. 
chapter 4 of this book of Malachi. I just wanted you to fix, I wanted to fix for you in that third chapter the fact that Christ was coming with judgment and he continues on, will a man rob God? How have you robbed God? You rob God when you pay tithes to someone that teaches Antichrist. That's what this really means. He said, bring the bread into the real storehouse, not a bunch of fake Baal worshipers. That's like furnishing the calf for the Baal worshipers before Elijah. A word to the wise is sufficient, and to the others it doesn't matter at this moment. Chapter 4 and verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly. Wickedly how? Worshiping Antichrist. Shall be stubble. In other words, the Shekinah glory of Almighty God will cause so much embarrassment on those that have allowed themselves to be deceived, they won't know which way to turn. So the fire of the Shekinah glory consumes them in shame. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. You know, a fire is far, fire burns over, it leaves the trunk, it leaves the root, and you see the shoots of the second growth, and in a matter of time you have another growth. God says, I'm not going to leave them even the roots. This fire will consume them to the very bottom of the longest taproot. Their sins shall be found out. What are their sins? Religious sins. The worst sin there is is to religiously follow instead of Jesus, to draw people into that trap. It's an awesome sin, and it's being committed by many, but thank God in ignorance, therefore, their cloak of innocency. Sometimes it's not too wise to wake people that you know can't hear. If it were possible, let me add. Do not picture this as a blowtorch scorching the earth. That isn't what it says at all. God's love is not sweet to those uh, that are against him. Verse 2. But unto you that fear my name, that reverence my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of a stall. You're going to be fed right in my stall. In other words, that same sun of righteousness, that brightness, does not burn you, but penetrates to your very soul the warmth of the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? Can you now understand why some will be praying for mountains to fall on them when they see His glory and then see the fire from His eyes? as he looks at them in disgust. He said, no wonder when he finally tells them, I love you and you will be taught that every knee will fall before Jesus. Every knee will bow, sinner and saint, when they see the true love on that first day of the millennium. Not this day, for the wrath of God is coming and it will come in this generation where are you going? Where are you going to be? Three, and ye shall tread down the wicked, and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this. The day that I will do what? Take this action, the action of wrath, saith the Lord of hosts. You think people are hard to deal with? They're not going to be. For God's elect, they'll be like ashes under your feet. There'll be nothing, mush, no backbones. If you take away all their pride that we read of in the verse, first verse, then you can work with them. Then you can deal with them. Those are our people. Verse 4, remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. Did he say forget it? He said remember it, which I commanded unto him in Oreb. For all Israel, not part of it, all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Verse 5, this is what we came here for. You listen to me closely. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet 
before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, as a scholar, I must warn you, it is possible there's even a footnote in the Companion Bible. I cannot remember for sure. Perhaps I should have looked. You can. Inasmuch as it does not say Elijah the Tishbit, then we do not know for certain that it be not a case again of someone in the spirit of Elijah. So understand, understand ye that are deep scholars, let it not offend nor, con nor um, mislead anyone in thought. Let it not be a stumbling block. Let me just say it again. Elijah shall come before the great day of the Lord. How do I know that? Because God just got through saying, I will send him. He didn't say maybe. He didn't say perhaps. He said, I will send him. Well, that was John the Baptist. Don't be stupid on me. What did John the Baptist say about it? No, I am not that one. Do we, are we so deaf that we cannot hear the words of John as we read them in that uh, uh, chapter we read in John? John 1? Of course we can if we had received him, if we had received Messiah, we'd be out of this mess now. We didn't. Our ancestors didn't. Therefore, we shall see Elijah just before that great day of the Lord. Beloved, listen to me. It shall happen in this generation. Verse 6, in conclusion. What is it he's going to do? I gave you the example in the first two segments of, of this study. You had a type of it, the widow, which is symbolic of Israel, her son, the offspring, the two sticks, the house of Israel, the house of Judah, the two sticks that would be joined back together by this one Elijah with a meal barrel that never runs empty for food, for truth uh, of God's word. And he shall, not maybe, he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Fathers, plural, meaning both the Godhead and the father of this earth age, which is to say Satan. Least I come and smite the earth with a curse. He's not going to come and smite it with a curse. He's going to send Elijah. The truth of God's word is already being taught. The Reformation has already begun. And many are being drawn to that word, to that truth. Uh, they are shaping up into that 7,000 that God promised Elijah that he would have the uh, use, the help, the comfort from them to fight this battle of the end times, which is no battle, for they are ashes under the feet of those with truth, for the truth burns and it will indeed burn on that great day, the Lord's day, which is upon us. How exciting the life of being a Christian. Christianity is not a religion. It is a reality. And you that have a destiny are a part of it. You have known since you were a child there was more to God's word than you had been taught. Let the simplicity of his truth... Uh, sink deep into your spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, and hear the calling of your Father as He gently, with that Shekinah glory, the Holy Spirit, draw you to Him, saying, Come, serve me. And in serving me, be a servant to the people, helping them, guiding them, strengthening them when they are deceived. Is He talking to you? Beloved, listen a moment. I want to share something with you share with you the Companion Bible. Of all Bibles, I recommend this as a study Bible. You know, we have the King James, and it's a beautiful work. Here's the King James with a parallel column, leather bound, and in the back of this wonderful Bible, you have 198 appendixes. Appendix taking you into 198 in-depth studies. Now, as an example, Genesis. Uh, now we go to the front of the, the Companion Bible. In Genesis, uh, you see eight verses, and then you see explanation in the column. Beloved, you as an English reader, it takes you back into the Hebrew 
allowing you to see and understand that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, period, that millions of years passed. For in verse 2, tuhu vabuhu, yes, you the English reader can read the Hebrew from the manuscripts showing you how that the world became void and without form, not that it was created void and without form. A Bible that any English reader can easily understand. Do you see it there on your screen? I hope you can make that out. Tuhu vabuhu. It became waste. So here you have a study tool that takes you from the milk and puts you into dead center meat. Uh, and how precious it is to have those tools available, including Masara, including, um, uh, including those appendix that go into so much depth, so much truth. We just thank our Father for this beautiful Bible. It is yours for a donation of $100 to the chapel to help you study deeper, more depth into God's Word. Okay, bless your heart. $100 gift in the Bible. We just want to send it to you. God bless you. All right, bless your hearts. We're back. Say, let's have those 800 numbers. You got a question? You got a comment? Did you enjoy that lecture on Elijah? Isn't it wonderful to know and understand our Father's words? If you do have a question or comment, you feel free. Dial 1-800-643-4645 or in this great state of Arkansas, 787 55 Six. Uh, share it with the old pastor and the rest of the family. Okay, uh, to begin with this evening, uh, and I might say, I think tomorrow evening, I'm still so far behind in questions, I think we're just going to play tomorrow in a lecture. We're just going to catch up these questions. I might do a commentary or two. I think we need to smoke a few. It won't hurt to smoke them every once in a while. Uh, by that I mean those offenders of God. And let's just look forward to maybe doing that. We'll let the Father lead. Uh, first, Jesse Paul from Indiana. Would you please call back in? We have an error in your order that we need to confirm. Would you do that, please? Uh, ask for Anna or Martha, either one. Okay, Bonnie from... Uh, well, we have no state, and I don't want to read the last name. This is a prayer. Bonnie, I understand your prayer and, and the situation that you're going through. You just hang in there and let the Father lead. Uh, and um, Isa from Arkansas, down one of my favorite parts of Arkansas. Uh, prayer request. After prayer with you, I had a healing. But I went to other churches who prayed for me, and I got all mixed up, and I got sick again. I want to know if there is any forgiveness for backsliding. Please pray for me again. Bless your heart. Dear, you listen to me. You must protect yourself God's way. It's important that you eat. God will heal people. It's, not, it's possible the other churches didn't cause this backsliding. It's possible that you didn't eat properly and the illness come back. There's how many times, uh, due, to the fa due to this part, how, what about backsliding? <clears throat> I really don't even like the word backsliding, but we'll use it. I, I'd, re I'd a lot rather use repentance. Jesus said 490 times a day if it takes it, 7 times 70. Just repent to him and tell him. We're gonna, he's going to heal you again. But you also, if you haven't had the tape 430, you let me know. Won't you do that? You let me do that. Incidentally, I just wonder if you know Mae Duncan or Denzel Duncan from your area there. Um, I'm related to them. Uh, Carmel from Ohio, please pray for the healing of my broken arm. Okay. And um, I believe that does the prayers. Father. We just ask that you hear the prayers of these, your children, Lord. Father, sometimes we don't know what all we're supposed to do as individuals, and we stumble in the dark. At times we make mistakes, and Father, we just ask that you forgive us. Forgive these. Touch and heal in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Father. We love you so much. Bless your hearts. Let the Holy Spirit and that Shekinah glory warm and heal you. Okay, Mark from Alabama, Luke 17, 36 and 37. 
two men in the field, who is taken, the saved or the unsaved? The unsaved. But do you know something, Mark? They're going to think they're saved because they're taken in what's called a rapture. There's just one sad thing. It's Satan that's doing the rapturing. And they're going to fly right into his bed. They sure are. And they are deceived. It's the same way in Mark uh, 13 and in Luke 20. I'm sorry, Matthew 24. The first ones taken are those that are deceived. We're supposed to stay in our Father's field, which is this world, until He returns doing His work, occupying until He returns, not flitting around like a lightning bug, which is not a light of spirit but of chemical emotions, the true light. Continue doing your Father's work. The first one taken is deceived by Antichrist. Luke 17 and 37, We're Lord, and he said unto them, Whithersoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered. What does this mean? Really, in another place it says where the carcass is gathered. In other words, Antichrist the beast system will be centered in Jerusalem. Where Christ was crucified, there's where you're going to find the gathering. As a matter of fact, Megiddo means the gathering place of the crowd, which is the prime made up of the army of, uh, of Armageddon, that is to say, the war of Armageddon, Megiddo. Okay, <clears throat> I'm on welfare. Am I supposed to give 10%? I think we should use common sense in all things. Just use your own judgment. You will never hear me ask or tell someone what they must do. That's strictly between you and Almighty God. Uh, as a matter of fact, in this building, the chapel itself, we never pass the so-called plate. There is an offering box in the entrance, but it's everybody's own private business what they do with that. You see. This is the reason. God blesses you with how you give using common sense or as the Spirit leads you. Therefore, it's a very personal thing, so I cannot tell you what to do. It's between you and God. But common, using common sense, also know this. You can't buy your way in, all right? You can't buy your way in. Using common sense means that if you have children, you don't give some church so much of your income on welfare that you can't feed your children, Christ would be quite angry at you for that and would punish you. But there could be a token that would turn the blessings of God around. That's common sense. Do you understand? Okay, enough said. Barry from Alabama. Is it okay to be baptized more than once? If you did not understand, if you were baptized in ignorance, then you have never been baptized Somebody has just dipped you in the water, friend. There is only one baptism. There are some mockeries up to that, or and I don't want to make people feel bad. It's just simply that you didn't know. Okay. Is it okay to ask Jesus into your heart more than once? Be real careful there. That smacks of second salvation. There's no such thing as second salvation. Christ does the saving, and he was able. It's we that let him down. It takes repentance after that. Repent, and he will come into your heart. I really enjoy the teachings from the Bible, and you really shed light on my life. Well, Barry, God bless, bless you, and, and thank you for that uh, report. Baptism is a very personal thing. Therefore, if a person has been baptized before, they must use their own judgment uh, as to how they feel. There's only one Christ. It doesn't matter what name, as long as in your mind you knew who you were being baptized to, then just because you changed churches don't feel you have to be baptized again. But if you did not really know Christ and peer pressure drew you into a baptism, but you did not feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, then you weren't baptized anyway. You were just given a cold shower, or <laughs> not a shower, but a bath. Dennis from Indiana, did I hear you say that the whole earth was not covered with the flood? Well, in a sense, but I must qualify it, and I request that you all listen to me very carefully when I'm teaching. 
this was preceded by the words, it is my opinion that the earth was not covered totally during the flood of Noah. It is my opinion, quite the contrary, however, that in the great flood of the Lord, the Tuhu Vavuhu, the Hebrew flood spoken of in Jeremiah chapter 4 and Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, again, I'm not speaking of Noah's flood, that it did cover the entire world. So, um, it was my opinion and my opinion only. In other words, it cannot be totally documented, but I feel that uh, Scripture um, bears it out pretty well. And a second question, why isn't the name of the Father used today? He gave it to us to be known and honored. On the few programs of yours that I have listened to you, you use his name, and it is really good to hear. Okay? Um, and the book you ask about is out of print at this time. The sacred name is a beautiful name. As a teacher, I must use the English and then the sacred name. But never make a religion out of that. Your grandmother perhaps never heard the sacred name, or her grandmother, whichever. But they believed in Jesus, and they're right there in his bosom now. Linguist, um, our linguist, and sometimes a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing if someone takes the sacred name and creates a religion from it. God never intended it that way. But use it to teach. Don't use it to advertise. Never put it on the outside of an envelope or on a signboard, for that is like re-crucifying Christ anew. For the passerby or that does not understand it may blaspheme it in ignorance and the sin does not fall upon him, but for you in publicly displaying the sacred name. Use caution, common sense. Uh, the name is not given. This comes from Florida. The first, call, first time caller, I think. Will I know my husband when we meet in heaven? Yes, my dear, you will. You will know him. Uh, documentation, Ezekiel chapter 44. Ophelia from North Carolina. The Jews were under the law. Could they have been lost because the law was all they had before Jesus came? Well, it, it was that in part, but then Christ taught them back. I dislike someone using the Jews, for they are not called the Jews. They're called the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The word Jews does not enter into the Word of God until quite far along, and then it is a mistranslation most usually. It either speaks of Judah in the manuscripts or Judea. Uh, like as an example, the word Jewry is used four times in the Old Testament. I believe that's correct. It's a, it's a made-up word. It doesn't exist, but the translators invented it. And it, it confuses people in following the tribes. So all the tribes, as well as the strangers that were among them, were under the law. And when Christ came, he said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I only came to fulfill it. I don't change one little jot of it. Now, the ordinances, yes. The statutes, some of them. Some of them he became. Okay, uh, but yes, in part, no one can, without the saving grace of Jesus, no one can, uh, can uh, have salvation. We're not, we're all sinners. That's being the reason. But remember, as it is written in Peter, he went back and he taught those and give them the same opportunity that we have, even while in the tomb. Lynn, when Christ went to Hades to teach all the souls, the one that didn't believe did they go to heaven or do they stay in Hades? Understand this, Hades is a figure of speech to this day. There is no such place as hell. It's always trans translated grave. We have a pit, the abyss, which is the holding place of Satan in which he is not now. He's in heaven. Heaven is wherever God is and near that location is paradise. Paradise can even be translated Gordon, Garden. I have a tape titled The Gardens of God. If you're not familiar with those 
places, you need to see what the scriptures really say, and I recommend that tape for that. But all souls return instantly that to the Father that gave them. The flesh goes back to dust, ashes, the, the minerals that God created that are transformed through metabolism into flesh rots. It's never again. It will never raise. It's going to be dirt, dust. We don't want it. It's pain. They are all in paradise awaiting judgment, awaiting millennium. And whatever their deeds shall determine whether they are left in paradise. But no one understand this one thing. No one at this point in time has been judged to die except Satan himself. I want to say that again. No one at this point and this time has been sentenced to die except Satan and 7,000 fallen angels. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Why? Because the sentence hasn't been handed out yet. Judgment has not taken place. God is not going to send someone to hell before they're judged. Anytime someone tells you that God does something that is unfair, they're a liar or deceived. Probably, maybe that's a nicer word. They're lying to you, all right? Don't listen to them. Carol from Tennessee, Ezekiel 38, uh, tells of the battle of uh, Hemingog. I take this to happen on the first day of the millennium. But if this is true, people who are then in incorruptible bodies spend a long time burying those killed by Gog in the battle. Please clarify. Uh, you're, you're almost on, but it's the last day of this earth age while men are still in flesh bodies. The battle of Armageddon is part of God's wrath. Deuteronomy 32, the song of Moses, that song that the overcomers will be singing, that God's elect will be singing, clarifies. It is that battle and that instant. It won't last five minutes. Then comes the change, the new body, the incorruptible body. And Carol, um, it doesn't really say months or years. It says seven, which is a perfect number. Seven being the dispensation of the millennium. It means we will be that long burying the dead, for the death, death will not be destroyed until the end of the millennium. Then it, at the second death, it is swallowed up and consumed. I'm sorry, he has another part to this. Ezekiel 39 mentions goats, lambs, bullocks that God would offer up for the ransoms, for the ravenous birds to eat. These are all sacrificial animals. Does this mean there will be no sacrifices in the millennium? No, it means that the carcasses, again, we're back to the last day of this earth age, the carcasses uh, of the flesh will rot and will return back to what they are. In a sense, it is a figure of speech. Okay, Zena from Michigan. Why are some people healed and some not? A pastor told her she was not a Christian if she wasn't healed. She is very sick, but can't seem to be healed. Well, Zena, I just finished a tape not long ago, why, why some people are healed instantly. I think that might be a blessing to you. It does not prove that one is a Christian or not a Christian. Why do people that understand some even have eyes to see and ears to hear, and yet God takes them in death? It's really quite simple. God is preparing an army both in heaven and here. And we will be wherever we are supposed to be in that army. Christ himself placed a thorn in the side of uh, Paul and refused to heal him after he returned from the third heaven. It hurt and he was sick but he was a Christian. Don't ever let a preacher tell you that. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Father, in Jesus' name, heal this child. Thank you, Father. 
Okay, uh, well, let's get our prayers real quick. Shirley from Virginia, prayer for my mother, uh, Lenny's bad heart, and can't find the cause. Well, I know someone that can. Shirley from Arkansas, prayer. My elderly aunt fell and shattered her hip, had to have a plate put in. Love you, Arnold, and all the crew. Thank you, Shirley. Jean from Pennsylvania, been listening for nine or ten months and have learned more than all the all the other put together other ministers put together ask prayer for the caller two broken bones that aren't healing right prayer for wife Elsie's arthritis father you hear the prayers you hear the children we love you as the God's elect touch and heal in Jesus precious name okay we'll continue on I tell you I'm still I think we're just going to take tomorrow for commentary maybe some current events and lend most of the program to questions. To, I apologize. I'm, I'm only now up to the ninth of the month, and I see one on the eighth out of place. Let me pull it up forward. Francis from Mississippi. What do you think of Nostradamus? Interesting, interesting. Uh, Levon from Texas. She no longer believes in the rapture, but her husband doesn't know what to think, and sh she wants to quit the ch her church their pastor is coming over tonight. Would you please comment? Well, with this having been called in the 9th, that would have been the 10th. I'm a little late on comment, but I think with the rapture theory having been played during that time, you probably got it all squared away. Well, bless your hearts, we're out of time. Stay tuned. Most, uh, most of you will be right back on these stations. For others, God bless you. We'll see you in the next day lecture. We love you. Stay in his word, study his word, be good to each other. Tell your mate that you love them. Tell your children that you love them, that you appreciate them. Be good to each other. Do not let Satan or any demonic into your homes. Keep them cleared out in the power in the name of Jesus. We're brought to you by your tithes and your offerings, supporting God's truth. The most important thing, stay in His Word every day, and it's a beautiful day. Jesus is the living Word. Thank you for joining with us in today's study of God's Word. If you would like to hear today's message again on audio cassette. Or if you would like to know some of the other deeper, in-depth studies that Pastor Murray has covered, write for the free tape catalog. Write Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. That's Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. And don't forget to mention tape catalog. Shepherd's Chapel also has a monthly newsletter letting you know what's happening at the chapel. So if you would like to receive this monthly newsletter, write to Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Thank you for joining us. And join us again each Monday through Friday at this same time for Shepherd's Chapel.